watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine that's broadcast in English and Persian by a new channel TV. Hello everyone, I'm Maram Namazi. And I'm Farid Borspuya. In this week's program, we interview Elham Mania from University of Zurich. She has a lot to say about Sharia law. We'll also be talking about executions in Iran, the execution of a man who the judge told, uh, well, if you are innocent, well, then you'll go to heaven and there shouldn't be a problem there. There's no justice. No justice whatsoever. We'll also be talking about the situation of women in Iran, more arrests uh, because of unveiled photos on the internet in Iran, uh, the fact that cycling in Iran makes women, uh, by women, makes society unsafe. We'll talk about the insane fatwa of the week, which is from Turkey, and how music is sinful. And of course, we'll have a wonderful slice of life from Pakistan with women getting on bicycles and reclaiming the public space. Don't go away. Stay with us. This week's news, we'd like to focus on some of, some of the things that are coming out of Iran. One of them is, of course, on the issue of executions. As you know, there are many executions taking place in Iran, including under the reformist uh, faction of the regime. One of the most heartbreaking uh, events that have taken place recently is the execution of a young man called Reza Hosseini in northern Iran. He's been constantly proclaiming his innocence. He's been, he had been charged with drug offenses. He was executed on the 3rd of May. And the judge told him, well, look, don't worry. If you're innocent, you'll go to God, you'll go to heaven. No problem there. And th this Outrageous. Is the, this is the justice in the Islamic Republic justice. of Iran. Don't expect any justice from the Islamist. The interesting thing is that he's, um, he, was, he got into altercation with the security forces in a parking of his, uh, around his house. And that's why he was arrested. Various charges followed. And, uh, and on, through the whole stages of uh, um, court and uh, persecution, he uh, always um, claimed that he was innocent and he wasn't involved in any yeah, drug. But even the, his the, court case was very few minutes only, absolutely. wasn't it? Yeah. And he, he, he stood in front of the judge that, uh, and said, look, I'm innocent. I haven't done anything. And the judge turns out and he says, don't mm -hmm. worry. If you're innocent, you go to heaven. Yeah, and a lot of people are saying it's similar to the witch trials, isn't it? Where witches were told that if, you know, if they don't sink, then people will know that they weren't really witches and they'll go to heaven, so no problem there. This is exactly what sort of religious justice looks like, Absolutely, doesn't it? but on the other side of the coin, you, coin you'll see that uh, there is a lot of uh, movement in opposition to uh, capital punishment in Iran. And one form of that is that people actually, or families of people, uh, forgiving the, uh, mm. the condemned, and they save them from the, from the gallows. I know yeah. that, that's a very strong movement, and we've seen in, uh, quite a few of those in Yeah, there's in been months. five recently, uh, just yeah. in, the, in the past uh, few weeks. And the thing about this is because of the eye for an eye retribution in Iran, that sometimes uh, there are situations where family members whose family members have been killed can then uh, say that they forgive they the, have the right to uh, the, the person yeah. on death row and then you know so you have these wonderful scenes where people have the noose removed from their neck and then they're they're saved as a result of families intervening where the Iranian regime uh, doesn't yeah. and that, that's the last resort but the movement against capital punishment yeah. in Iran it's very strong and the demand to abolish capital capital punishment capital punishment is there at the top of the demands of the Iranian people. Yeah, definitely. And of course, another important movement in Iran is the movement for women's liberation. A large part of that is the move to unveil. And, you know, we've seen a proliferation of unveiled women on streets taking photos and sharing that on social media. But we've just heard news of eight women who've been arrested uh, for posting unveiled photos of themselves on Instagram. They're being called models and, uh, uh, you know, the, the government is clamping down because they say their behavior is Western promiscuity and un-Islamic. And of course, this is clearly, you know, just some more effort by the regime to clamp down on women's unveiling. And this is a lost war for the Islamic Republic Definitely. of Iran because We've always said, and it's proven time and again, Iranian society 
is not an Islamic society and the right of women to dress as they wish it's there and it's recognized in society and uh, you know no matter how much effort and resources the Islamists mm -hmm. put into this they've lost the war. Well they have lost the war in Iran of course so when uh, they are overthrown and they're trying to run away somewhere they should come and join the LSC and possibly uh, have gender segregated and veiled events there because the student union loves those sort of events, yes. don't they? Yeah. As do uh, the Islamic society. Well, can I just say, when the Islamic <laughs> Republic of Iran is overthrown, all of these people will, yeah. you can't find them anywhere, we, not even in LSC. Yeah, the, and that'll be a great day. Uh, you know, and the other follow up to this attack on women, this constant attack on women, is this thing that the Imam, um, the Friday Prayers le leader, has said in uh, last Friday is that women who cycle in public are creating insecurity in society. Uh, well, clearly, the only insecurity being caused in society is by the Friday prayer leaders and the regime itself. And this is, the, you know, a, the, there is a demand. Actually, there is a move for Iranian women to actually cycle on the streets and we could see the, the pressure is on. That's why every day they have to co go on the, you know, uh, on the pulpit of the Friday pray and constantly attack women and that's you know this is has no effect in Iranian society Iranian society is an un Islamic society on April 30th El Hamania came to speak at a conference we had organized on parallel legal systems in this country, in Great Britain. We managed to have a brief interview with her on her recent book uh, on Sharia law and women, its implications and consequences for women's rights, citizenship rights and equality. Stay with us and listen to this wonderful interview. Hello, Elham uh, Mania. Thank you so much for doing the interview with me. I wanted to talk to you about your new book. Tell us why you felt you had to write a book about Sharia law in Britain. Um, it's actually based... Um, the reason is very personal. Um, it has to do with a discussion that was taking place in Switzerland um, where um, um, a professor was suggesting the introduction of some aspect of Islamic law in the legal process of Switzerland. But he, while I have to also to mention that he was saying we have to do it in a way that respects human rights. It's very important to say that. And I just finished at that time um, field work in different Arab countries and was faced with the reality of legal pluralism and Islamic law. The effects how it reflects on the lives of women. So you can imagine me coming, a woman rights activist, a scholar, and coming from with this background, and someone is telling me in the name of your religion, uh, it would be good if we introduce um, uh, this type of law. And um, the more I researched, the more I realized that it's an expression of a paradigm of thinking that seems to be dominant in post-colonial, um, uh, post-modern uh, academic circles. And um, given the fact that many were basically using Britain as a good example, I thought it would be wise to investigate this example. And um, when I did that, I just realized it's um, with all due respect, the road to hell can can be is, is paved with good intentions and this respect. You, you talk about these good intentions uh, and the fact that the consequences of these good intentions are really bad. What are some of the consequences when you talk about real lived experience of women who are facing these laws? So, um, the main argument of the book is basically this is not a theoretical argument. This is not a theoretic discussion that you can basically talk about and you think life is good with this. Uh, we can basically discuss it. Um, the main argument is that you have two aspects to consider, context and consequences. And when you look at the consequences, you realize that, that you are asking for the legitimization of 
systematic discrimination against women. What are we asking for? Which law we would like to introduce? It's a law that is based on a corpus of legal opinions that were designed and written in a period between the 7th and the 10th century. And they inherently reflect the historical uh, period, but also the perception of women at that time. And that, you see it in the way that Islamic law today looks to women. Um, it looks to women in terms of as um, perpetual minors, as um, people uh, w um, in need of protection of a guardian. Um, it doesn't look, uh, it certainly treats women as, as not separate from her husband. There's a hierarchy in family life, family structures. She owes her husband obedience. Of course, he has to um, support her financially, but the two are basically intrinsic, the obedience. And from this perspective, with all due respect, you have a law that respects man and woman as equal before the law, and you're asking me right now in the name of a very strange concept of uh, minority rights to introduce a law that inherently discriminate against me, and you think you're protecting my religious identity with that? You're not. You're discriminating against me. What do you say to people, though, who say that how can people's religious rights be respected if you don't allow for Sharia courts? What do you say to people who say how can you respect religious rights if you don't acknowledge and implement religious courts? I believe uh, that this is an abuse of the, uh, the concept of freedom of religion. I think it's an abuse because please l let's just consider the laws that were here dominant um, whether in England or in Switzerland or in the United States family laws that were discriminating against women because of the way they were inspired by religious um, worldviews. Um, today these laws went away they were secularized and reformed in a way that uh, integrate the concept of um, uh, gender equality and gender just, justice. Similarly, if we look at Islam, it's not a critique against my religion, Islam, not at all. It's a critique against a legal dimension that discriminates against women, and it's a legal dimension that belongs to another a historical period. And from this perspective, this is not respect for freedom of religion, this is discrimination against um, uh, women and children within, because children are affected as well, um, within Muslim communities. And um, while I, I have to repeat this again and again and again, freedom of religion is absolute, yes, but how you manifest this religion is not. And it's very important to, if you are going to violate women's rights or human rights, children's rights, LGBT rights in the name of religion, then with all due respect, that cannot be accepted. That cannot be accepted. You talk about the reasons why we have come to this point where we have these courts. What are some of those reasons? Well, it's, um, you know, the book has different di dimension, and I and I and I and I talked about the problematic aspect. Um, uh, there are certain policies that were taken uh, uh, and reflected directly on uh, on the type uh, on the system that we're having today. That said, at the same time, there's a problematic concept of multiculturalism uh, connected to um, a politics of difference, you know? Because multiculturalism, as I, 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 I understand it, is a system where we basically, it's, it's accepting each other, cherishing uh, uh, our heritage, um, with that, uh, 
um, regardless of gender, race, uh, religion, um, what is what happened, however, one took this concept and put it in a context where basically, instead of cherishing what brings us together, we cherish what separates us, what makes us different. And by focusing on what, what makes us different, um, so, you, w one groups became more or less, this is like an individual was defined by his group identities, put into boxes. And while put in these boxes, uh, you have you don't have mul multiculturalism here in Switzerland. You have monoculturalism, and I said that in the book, because it's like it's, it's like um, close communities uh, touching uh, each other, barely knowing each other, and at the same time suspicious of each other. That's not multiculturalism as I understand it. That's not it. Uh, so you see, there are different reasons. There is a, a sick. Sick. Um, tendency uh, by some intellectuals to to fall for the arguments of Islamists who are promoting identity politics, who are promoting the 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 idea that there is something called one Islam, one religious Islamic identity. These are, we have one group and this group has demands. Uh, it's Islamists who are demanding that. They are the loudest, they shout well. And they have um, also very intelligent strategies in terms of like uh, influencing decision-making uh, processes here. And from this perspective, um, and I mentioned that also in the book, that until 2007, uh, 2005, um, the one, the speaking partner of the British government when it comes to the Muslim was the Muslim, uh, the, the, the British Muslim Council, you know? And then there was a survey conducted by uh, uh, a think tank which showed that only 6% of Muslims think that this organization represents them. 6%? And you've been talking with them as their partner uh, in your discussion about Islam for the last three decades, you know? Or since they were uh, created in the, uh, in the 90s? And shows you there's something, funda something fundamentally wrong was done here. What do you say to people who say it's anti-Muslim to focus on Sharia law? Anti-Muslim? No, I don't think it's anti-Muslim at all. It's like I, I always say that I'm talking from within. And at the same time, I think we have every right to criticize laws when they are discriminatory, uh, regardless of their sources. And from this perspective, this is a human rights struggle. And it's, it's a human rights struggle that, that touches on laws that can infringe on our human rights and, uh, and individual freedom. And from this perspective, uh, I would appreciate, and I think I talked about that also within the book, I would appreciate very much if we look at the discourses, the struggles that are taking place within Islamic countries. And as you said, Karima Bannoun, uh, in her marvelous book, uh, Your Fatwa Does Not Apply to Me, she put it, and she said that the struggle against Islamism is the most uh, neglected struggle in the, in, the, in the fight for human rights. Because one realizes this is a fight, in fact, against an ideology that's mainstreaming the idea that Sharia is something religiously sanctioned and necessary, and Sharia is something that is very inherently part of our religious identity. This is Islamist uh, discourse, Islamist ideology. And uh, what we are saying, we are de deconstructing their argument and telling and saying, as a Muslim, I'm talking here, I can criticize these laws because I understand it's a process in all religions, you know. And with that, I'm not um, getting out of my faith. All I'm saying that these laws are discriminatory. They belong to a different historical period. 
legal opinions, we can change that. We can change it. You talked a lot about the fact that we need to move beyond all these differences and barriers and boundaries, look at each other as citizens and humans, first and foremost. And you had a plea at the conference and in your book about how things can change for the better. Tell us, uh, tell us about that. Yes, uh, uh, I believe um, it's about time that we, we have a different paradigm. We need a paradigm shift, you know, one that doesn't put us in boxes, in religious boxes, one that treats us as individuals, as humans, you know, that we go, that we go beyond these religious boundaries, these identity boundaries, and at the same time expect. Sec there are rules of the games, in my opinion. And these rules of, of the games should be grounded uh, on principles of human rights, on equality, on gender justice, you know. And, and from this perspective, we have to respect these uh, rules as something applicable for everybody across all religious identities. You cannot come to me and tell me in the name of my religion, I'm going to beat my wife or I'm going to have four wives. Uh, or I'm going to uh, marry off my daughter at the, at the ninth, when, when she's nine years old because I think she's fit, she got her period. So from this perspective, we, we have to go beyond these identity uh, discourses, but at the same time, work together. Understand that we are all in this together. Whether we like it or not, we are all in this together. And we have a task here to to defend the values and norms that are dear to us, you know. I don't look at this as British values, Swiss values. I, I see them as universal values, universal values that brings us all together and they are there to protect us. That's the main thing. They protect us as humans. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> okay. We hope you enjoyed the interview with Elham Mania. I mean, brilliant woman uh, talking about her brilliant book. I think it's going to uh, be a really important book. It's out very soon. And I think, you know, the main thing she talks about, and we've discussed this before as well, is that when you're talking about Sharia courts, whether it's in Britain, whether it's in Iran, whether it's in um, Afghanistan, anywhere, it's not a theoretical discussion. This is a discussion which has real implications on women's lives and rights in particular when you're talking about family matters and you know she keeps stressing the fact that consequences matter and they do yeah and i think uh, when we refer to the fact that it's not a theoretical matter it doesn't mean that we we're not prepared to analyze it actually we analyze it a lot more than uh, anybody else but the issue the important part of it is its implication complete misogyny i mean the core of the islamic sharia law is misogyny is inequality between men and women and nobody no society should be able to accept that under any pretext there is no need for a panel of discussion there is no need for research there is no need for Co you know unending commissions that the british government keeps trying to commission start to be ends. set up to look at it ask people whether they want Yes, uh, Sharia law or not, is unjust and no society should accept it. Exactly. Simple. Insane Fatwa of the Week is from Turkey and it's from the Religious Directorate, which is a governmental body. Well, they have a religious director the first? Uh, Erdogan does. Is this on the Erdogan? I, oh, this is crazy. It's so crazy. And they've got some ridiculous fatwas. This one that brought our attention to this directorate is, of course, the fact that, well, not all music is sinful as long as it praises God and, is, uh, and uh, follows Islamic morality. But if it, for example, shows things that are sinful as beautiful, which is basically everything, or sexually arouses you, then it's, you guessed it, haram. Oh, wow. This is, uh, is it, aren't these the same guys who said women cannot laugh in the street? 
I don't know, but it, they that? might have been. Yeah, they might have been. They're also the ones who've said that if you have an abortion, you need to pay, pay five camels. To them. To, most probably to, to them. They need it, I think. <laughs> and, you know, they're the ones who've said that if the fam the boy and girl are engaged, they shouldn't be left alone. Otherwise, it would be a sin. If, you know, you wax yourself, it's a sin. I mean, basically, everything's a sin. They've got it in for everything, including <laughs> music, rock music. <laughs> <laughs> they don't like rock music. It's a sin. So keep doing it, basically. Especially if it's sexually arousing. <laughs>
You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream. And in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.